Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Great to see everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Hey. So good to see everybody. Mm -hmm. I know. I'm a little jealous. We've got some U.S. people, counterparts joining us today, and they're in nice warm weather, potentially, compared to us up here, Northerners in Ontario. So yeah. nice to have We you. have sunshine today, which beats the rest of this we week. Know. I'm in Burlington today, and I don't have any sunshine. Oh, really? So it's what are the... What are the temps in Canada right now? Minus nine for me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, hurts. it hurts. So my boyfriend and I are watching that <clears throat> TV show Alone. Have y'all seen that where they take them to like Antarctica and they like, drop them off and like they're trying, like the person who survives the longest without tapping out wins like half a million bucks. Oh. Like. I wouldn't even care about that money. Like, no, <laughs> it wouldn't be for me. <laughs> no. What's the weather like for you, Anne? Um, it's nice. <laughs> I hate to gloat. I okay. hate to gloat. Now it's not like we're 80 degrees. Um, where, where are you in? I'm in Houston, Texas. Nice. So I'm even, I'm four hours South of Michelle. Well, Michelle's normally in Dallas, but I'm, I even get warmer than she does. So, um, yeah, 60, we do get down to the thirties, um, and forties, but I, I'm just going to be silent because I have no, <laughs> I feel yeah, I'm thinking in Fort Worth, it's supposed to be in the sixties all weekend and I'm in Charlotte right now. And it's like 35. So, so I love my boyfriend. <laughs> take our age view on the road and come down to Houston okay when we do yeah absolutely Houston yeah that sounds good there. I would love it's that a, it's a date you sweat bullets down here so our Although, humidity oftentimes are you know is 95 percent so you have in the well lots of times of the year I open up the back door and my back door is dripping with water it's all so over that's the when handle. you want to be in Fort Worth it's, so so Houston gets moist but you don't have human. to really worry about moisturizer because we're <laughs> we're we've got a lot of moisture <laughs> oh dear well we've got a couple joining us one and one uh joining from winnipeg minus two where she is <gasps> yeah we're all, we're all i think i would die i really <laughs> I think too. my body would go into complete shock if I was in temps that ridiculous. <laughs> Y'all can all come live with me. <laughs> you just have to find something you like. That's, that's the ticket, right? You have to find whether it's ice skating or skiing or tobogganing. Um, yeah. You have to find that thing that you like. And then Canada then is beautiful. That's what oh, yeah. like, I it really is. cannot wait to come and visit. Carrie, like how long have we been talking about me coming to visit? <laughs> I think almost four years. <laughs> but a I keep long time. Yeah. <laughs> you got to do it. You've got to do I it. I can't wait. Yes, I do. And let's go. Yeah, yeah it's a date. But I'm still, I'm still going to do the summer. The only time I've been to Canada is I was in Calgary and I did do um, Stampede. Oh, and I was, was the... Really ugly American that like was like woo, 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 you know, <laughs> doing all that stuff and all the Canadians were like hmm. <laughs> I, but I had a ball it was so much fun and the energy and um it was gorgeous and did a lot of tootling around there so anyway <laughs> very <laughs> well I think that we are we're we're all here. There may be some more that are trickling through, but I think that we're good to get started. Um, we're very, very excited to be here today. Um, there's going to be a lot of us. So I will say, if anybody does have a question, we'll try our very best to get to them. Um, but we have a lot to fit in within an hour and we want to give the two of you plenty of time to, um, to share with us. So post your questions using the Q&A. And like I say, we will try to get to them. Um, if you just have a quick comment or you wanna say hi, feel free to use the chat function. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna hand it over. And Kathleen, if you could introduce our guest speakers, that would be great. Sure. sure. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. We're really excited to have you as our special guest to kick off 2021. And thanks to everybody for uh, being online with us today. 
Um, so here we go. We have Michelle Hudson. Uh, she is on faculty and consults with clients through Productive Dentist Academy. She's a full-time clinical hygienist with Dr. Bruce Baird at Granbury Dental Center. She holds advanced certification in laser therapy. She's an expert on oral systemic connection and protocol implementation, and a graduate of the Bale Donine Method Preceptorship, which is advanced training in heart attack, stroke, and diabetes prevention. Michelle is also the co-host of Reflection Health, which is produced by A Tale of Two Hygienists, Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnson and co-host of AOSH's Facebook live show with founder, Dr. Chris Kammer. So then we have the lovely Anne O'Rice and Anne graduated from Wichita, oh, Wichita, I'm <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Wichita State University and then graduated her studies and earned a bachelor's degree in oral health promotion. She is a graduate of the Bale Donine Preceptorship um, course for cardiovascular disease prevention for healthcare practitioners. After almost 30 years of clinical care, she founded Oral Systemic Seminars and is passionate about educating the community on all things oral systemic health and is focused on prevention strategies for dementia and those relationships in dentistry. Um, in 2020, Anne became a fellow with the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health, a certified dementia practitioner, and became certified as a brain longevity specialist with the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. All I can say is, wow, ladies, that is super impressive. You know, like, what started both of you on the oral systemic and heart brain health journey? Anne, you go first. Oh, please. It's taxing my brain. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I was a hygienist, you know, there's an ebb and flow in the career, right? We all are like, we're in it. And then, you know, you kind of drop off a little bit. And some years ago, um, oral cancer exams, which were so not a lot of people were doing them, unfortunately, um, that started the ball kind of rolling. And I cannot remember where I originally heard about Dr. Brad Bale and, and Dr. Amy Doveen, um, and then started moving forward in that direction. And, and, uh, with brain health, then, you know, life gets in the way and then you have personal, um, family members, um, as too many people do. Um, and I started to do some research to prevent it in me. I don't want it to be me. I don't want it to be anybody. But as I started doing research, I started putting some things together of prevention strategies and risk factors, and then looked at what I did in the dental chair every single day. And they were a lot of assessments that I already did, um, talking about blood pressure and sleep and, and uh, diabetes with my patients and nutrition and so on and so forth. And so that's kind of how it all collided for me. Um, gosh, I have always, like I went into dental hygiene believing that we truly played a huge role in whole body health, but I had no idea just how big that role was. So I started I was a dental assistant first and that, uh, was about 21, 22 years ago. And, uh, and, uh, that did not, that was short lived because I really felt that the hygiene role would be much more like that was my avenue to love my patients. Well, and, uh, and I've loved every single second of it since I began that journey. And uh, so I, 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 I believed that I believed I was doing a great job prior to working for Dr. Bruce Baird and Dr. Jeff Booski, but I wasn't even coming close to understanding mm -hmm. how amazing our opportunity, the potential that we have to create change uh, within our patients and improve the quality of their life is until I started working for Granbury Dental Center. And that was uh, 12 and a half years ago. And, um, it's amazing. So I walk into this office and I knew it was special and uh, Carrie, you know, Bruce so well, so, you know, he has just this amazing energy, but this office was doing things differently. Even then 
the way that they were diagnosing perio and treating perio was in, in talking whole body health. I was like, wait, I wasn't doing that. It was very uncomfortable at first because it was so different. And they were, I was learning things that I did not learn in school. And I had a, I had a professor tell me or tell our entire class the last week of college said, you know more right now than you're going to know your entire career. She was so wrong Mm -hmm. there. I mean, I could pass the national boards, right? But there was so much more that the exciting stuff I learned after I graduated when I started working for Bruce and Jeff and they were, they were looking at airway. So physiologic is huge in our office. So sleep apnea, and this is when no one was very few dentists were, were doing this and looking at this. And we were working with physicians. Paul Thompson at that time was the only physician that we were working with, but it was, it was different. It was different. And for periotherapy, even, you know, 12 and a half years ago, I was seeing a patient for periotherapy until they no longer had any signs of inflammation. They were no longer bleeding. And so the new AAP guidelines, you know, that's what it is encouraging. Y'all, we were allowed to do this in our office 12 and a half years ago. It was incredible. And before I started working for Bruce and Jeff, I really felt like I was always fighting to get my patients healthy and keep them healthy. And then seeing how Bruce and Jeff did it and my patient, I have patients now who were, were healthy when I began seeing them with periodontal disease and they're still healthy. And then I have other patients because of st- systemic reasons, you know, we've had to keep them, you know, you know, every two months uh, recall and they've been through periotherapy, you know, more than once and, and that's okay. That's okay how we're looking at things. Um, four and a half years ago, Bruce Baird went to an Amy Donneen presentation in Hawaii. And Amy Donneen and Brad Bell wrote Beat the Heart Attack Gene. So that's the preceptorship. That, and Carrie, you've been through that as well, haven't you? I have the book sitting right here beside me because I'm actually, I had a patient came in yesterday and um, she came in and she's going for knee replacements actually next week. So I needed to fit her in. So I saw her yesterday for my first day back in Perio in a few months. And we had to fit in an emergency. Uh, we put some silver diamond fluoride on one of her teeth because we didn't want to leave it to the surgery. And she says, oh, awesome. I got a call. She said, I have three blocked arteries. They just told me the anesthesiologist was reviewing my case and I have three blocked arteries. What do I do? And I'm like, you need to read this book. <laughs> And I'm going to drop it off at your house before you get into quarantine. So phenomenal resource, phenomenal um, education, Dr. Brad and um, uh, Dr. Amy, they honestly are great resources. They're traveling across the country. They're really starting to kind of, they brought us all together, but really recommend you reading this. It is, it is great. It is. And Les, I don't know if we mentioned Dr. Brad Bell is a medical doctor. Amy Donine is a nurse practitioner. And the research that they have is astronomical at the role that periodontal disease plays in heart health. So when Bruce heard her, uh, he comes back and we have monthly meetings and he's always bringing new stuff, throwing new stuff at us. But y'all, this was different. This was life-changing. And so he, he is the co-founder of Productive Dentist Academy. And we had an event a few months later. My son was a senior and I went to that and I didn't want to miss a second, but I had to go because I had to learn from Brad Bell because I wanted to be better for my patients. And since then, it's just, it was a snowball effect and everything I've learned. I got connected with AOSH, you know, then Carrie and because we were doing started, we began doing salivary testing four years ago and y'all my whole world, like talk about empowering the hygienist and the dentist. When you start talking and really start looking, get out of the mouth and start looking inside the body. Oh, you change and you instill value like you never have before within your patients. The joy that you have for your profession, it doesn't go away. Again, I've never had burnout. And 
because I love it so much because we're always learning, right, ladies? Like we're a, obsessed with this. So, so Michelle, if, if you, if uh, the first step obviously is diagnosing and then educating, can you give us some tips how you go about discussing, beginning the discussion with your patients? Um, yes. Yeah, so, oh, there's so much. So the way that Bruce Baird, and I always have to give credit to the people who taught me the things that, that I teach. So Bruce Baird, who I believe learned many of the things that he taught was through COIS, the risk factors. So our patients, which it, it does not have to be set up this way, um, but in our office, the, our new patients see our doctors first. And what our doctors look for are four risk factors. So the first thing we do is a very thorough health history. And we're looking, we have the Epworth uh, sleeping a scale in there. So we're looking at sleep from the get-go. And so there's the, the great health history. And then the patient's brought back to, uh, with, by the assistant. And they fill out a couple of other risk assessments that they're doing. And so that's really taking a deeper dive and even looking at family history for, you know, heart health, brain health, uh, sleep, um, and then of course, periodontal disease and caries disease. And um, like, we don't wanna keep saying decay. We wanna start talking about caries. It is a disease. And so then, so we've done these assessments. So before my doctor x-rays, um, microscopes are typically done in my room, but I think a great place to start with a microscope would be in that comp exam, whoever sees them first. Um, so it's a lot of stuff and it's a little overwhelming, um, but an hour with the doctor looking at all these assessments before Dr. Baird or Dr. Booski even walk into that operatory, the patient already has an idea, wait, I've never knew that by me having heart disease that my oral health my oral health was affecting my heart I didn't know because I have a family history of Alzheimer's and dementia that it could possibly be linked to my oral health so they're already thinking so they're already excited they're hearing things they've never heard before it's um they're they're participating in the diagnosis. They're participating in every single step. So doctor will come in and first thing he talks is periodontal disease. Cause guess what ladies, we all know we're all hygienists. That's foundation. You cannot have a healthy mouth unless that foundation is healthy. So we do that based on the AAP guidelines and uh, Carrie, I, I know that y'all know these very well and um, so we look at those and we speak that piece with the patients and we give them forms when we leave, they leave with a lot of information. So we look at perio that's addressed first. We look at caries disease. What's their risk factor there? Xerostomia plays a big part in that health plays a big part in that. Then we look at function and we look at physiologic. So does this patient potentially have sleep apnea? So it's pretty exciting. It's a lot, the big Part of that's done in the doctor's office, takes an hour with them, and then they come to us and we take a deeper dive and we get to spend more time with them explaining each of those risk factors. So exciting. Thank you. It sure. really is. So, Anne, I know I've heard you talk about this wedding gift, this special wedding gift. You think <laughs> that all couples should be. <laughs> So would you like to enlighten <laughs> our listeners today on what that special wedding gift is? Yeah. And you'll be the lame uh, wedding guest because <laughs> I, I really believe this. And as a hygienist, you can understand it. It's a blood pressure cuff. Now, like I said, it's not the set of towels, but a blood pressure cuff is going to instill um, it, or as monitoring your blood pressure throughout your life is going to give newly married couples a longer leash on life. We know that high blood pressure contributes to virtually every system that's falling apart. Heart disease in the United States is still the number one killer for both men and women. So when we think blood pressure, right, we're thinking about heart disease, um, cardiovascular disease, clogging of the arteries. When I think about blood pressure now, um, I think about it a little bit differently in regard to brain health. So our brain has 400 miles of blood vessels. That's a lot. Um, in order to keep your brain functioning, you have to have the blood flowing, right? And we know that blood pressure constricts the vessels. We have to have the blood flowing that that gives us the oxygen 
right, to our brain because our brain uses 20% of our oxygen and 20% of our blood flow. However, if you're scaling the distal of number um, 32 and we're not using our ultrasonics because of a pandemic and we're digging in there and we're concentrating, their tongue is like the size of a beanbag chair, you, they're drowning. Um, then you're using over 50% of your oxygen and blood flow. Mm -hmm. So it is critical for the brain to have all of those systems working perfectly. When it comes to blood pressure, we know that um, high blood pressure raises your risk of stroke by over 85%. That's ischemic stroke. Then that in turn increases your risk of dementia two to three times. Mm -hmm. So you can have dementia before a stroke, but then it exponentially increases it after a stroke. We know that high blood pressure affects something called the blood brain barrier, which the blood brain barrier is just a membrane. And it is the, um, I don't know, little soldiers for our brain. It's trying to keep toxins out. But as we age, that becomes more permeable. So things are able to enter the brain um, more easily. It's a very complex structure and very complicated, but um, high blood pressure reduces the permeability of this blood brain barrier. And one more thing I wanna mention that is really important. Um, I'm just gonna assume that everyone on the call is taking blood pressure on their patients. Um, you have a front seat as a clinician. Some of these patients are seeing four times a year. Um, hopefully people are monitoring if they have been diagnosed with high blood pressure. They're doing that at home and they're charting it themselves. But so many people don't know they have high blood pressure and you are the first line to save their, not only heart life, but to save their, their brain health as well. There was a recent study that came out um, and this is where, it, it, this isn't an old person issue. This is midlife, which with Alzheimer's disease, um, what you do 20 to 30 years before the, the symptoms manifest um, is the critical component. And we know that midlife high blood pressure doubles your risk for Alzheimer's disease. So if you have a patient, she's 40 years old, he's 40 years old, and they have high blood pressure, this isn't the time that you say, ah, it's a little bit high. This isn't the time that you go, oh, we'll check it next time. These are, this is the critical time. They did a very large study. Um, people all born the same uh, week in 1946 and they traveled from their thirties all the way to 70. The numbers were astronomical for women in their forties, 73% higher risk of dementia with midlife high blood pressure. We are at the front line to save these patients. And that it's just by taking the blood pressure. Um, I, it, it, people argue, I get people say back, well, you know, their doctor says, I don't really care what their doctor says and, and what transfers from a patient in their medical practice to what comes into your office, maybe two different things, right? I don't know what they're saying. But it is our obligation to inform the patient, not to browbeat them, of course, but to, to inform the patient about this critical importance of blood pressure. So that's the boring wedding gift of the future. I think so I also share a little bit. So periodontal disease plays a role in high blood pressure. There was actually a great study that was done. Carrie, I know you speak this when you speak as well, but in that study, if you have active periodontal disease, you're on average systolic can be nine points higher and diastolic could be five points higher. Do not be afraid. We absolutely have a responsibility to talk blood pressure, especially with our patients with active disease. Um, I have a patient, Jane, and I talk this and I know ladies y'all have heard this before but Jane I had her four visits and I've been seeing her I've been seeing her for you know the 12 and a half years I've been there she's one of the very first patients that I had I love this woman she has always she lives a very healthy lifestyle uh, she's a yogi she's a hiker she's uh, beautiful inside and out and she always had very healthy blood pressure then she comes in about that eight year mark and she has um, elevated blood pressure. It's 150s over 90, which was extremely unnormal for her. And so I actually took it three
three different times and, and recommended she see her physician. Um, I will not go into the details of the entire story, but just know the third time I saw her, she still had high blood pressure and her doctor was one of those doctors. We'll just watch. You're doing everything right. It's just your age and infuriates me. She comes back for her fourth visit. Jane never misses a visit ever. She's clockwork and it was pushed out two months I walk out to get her and she stands up and she starts crying and she walks towards me and she said I will never not listen to you again so do not be afraid she had a stroke and and if she weren't so healthy she would have not made it and she's made a full recovery it took about two years fight for your patients, yeah. love them. Do not be afraid. We absolutely have a role of me in metabolic syndrome. We play a role in three of those five diseases and blood pressure is one of them. See, Michelle, I said, you should, you should have held your microphone. Cause that would have been one of those, <laughs> you know, mic that <laughs> moment, <laughs> right? but no, on, but honestly, thank you both for just articulating that so well and reminding us and empowering us to just like you said, look out for our patients. Michelle, I was just hoping to take you back just slightly. You were talking a lot about the kind of the assessment tools that you have in place to find those risk factors. And then you even alluded to some aha moments for your patients when they started to see those connections. Are there any tools or tips that you can give us to actually, once we have those assessments done, how do we articulate that or educate our clients on those risk factors? So visuals, and please y'all share with me if you feel that there's a different way. I think visuals are incredible. So those are light bulb moments. Do y'all agree? Okay. So one thing that we do, of course, we do those risk factor assessments. And a great source for that is AOSH, American Academy for Oral Systemic Health. They have some great infographics. They're very basic. If you want more than that, you can reach out to us. I'm sure that each one of us can teach you how to do even those a little bit better. But by first, they see this visual and then based on their microscope. And um, so microscopes are an awesome tool. Do any of you have a microscope in your practice? Yeah. I Kathleen, you used to have one. I you? used to, yeah. When I Don't was you love the microscope? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's a fantastic visual. Well, one, uh, there's a high risk bacteria that we can see in that, and that's a spirochete. And we know that if you have spirochetes, then that does put you at a risk for heart disease. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also, and, and this is your area, but even it affects brain health. And so with that, I believe, so that's a great place to start. I also really encourage salivary testing. And the thing that I get all the time is why would I salivary test my patient? What do I do with it once I know what bacteria they have? Well, what is, what, are, I mean, what do we do with any tests that we do? Our doctors are doing the standard of care testing, which we could do a whole lot better than that standard of care testing. Salivary testing should be standard of care in dentistry. By looking at that, we know what that oral systemic connection is. Um, Carrie, this really is your area. So please butt in if you have a better way to explain this. But then based on what their bacteria load is, we know how to treat them. If I have a patient that has, you know, AA or PG, I know that just that mechanical debridement alone is not going to get rid of that. So we need something more. And then I also know when I have those bacteria present within my patients, I need to always see them more frequently. Yes, we may get to them to a place of stability, but we want to keep them at that place of stability. So I will continue to see those patients every three to four months for the rest of their life because I know what their risk are. And I think with the pathogen testing and understanding your numbers, it's like having your blueprint for your blood pressure, right? If you don't know what your numbers are, you don't know whether you're winning or you're losing. Mm -hmm. And every office has different options. So maybe you've got a laser that you can use to help keep the bacteria level down. Maybe you're using antibiotics, whether it be in a rinse or in a, a pill form. Maybe you're doing oral irrigation. Maybe you're doing airflow. Maybe you're doing all these other adjuncts. Mm -hmm. But you have to know your numbers. And unless you go back and understand it and record all your indices, and that's why, you know, Anna Louise all of us on the panel here love the 
AAP stuff because it really brings us back to looking at the records, bringing in risk yeah. assessment. It has to be part of our conversation. And these are just tidbits or small bits of what it is that we do, but we really have to be as visual as we can with the patients to kind of mm -hmm. keep it all, to keep them engaged and to make it friendly. And we may have all this information, but all we want to talk about is one item with the patient. We can't overwhelm them and we can't mm -hmm. beat them up. We've got to give them hope. And I think that's what all of us are really great at doing. Now with, with the circle of care, um, what, what other healthcare professionals would you collaborate with? Uh, all of them. All of your clients, like all of them. So, um, you always want to work with a physician and we have a few groups that we work with. And then I am a big believer in working with nutritionists. And, uh, um, I had a patient this week that I've been seeing for a long time. She was diagnosed with diabetes. We are doing a one C testing in our office now, which I really love. And we're really, um, we're really big advocates in, in that area. And, and it's, and so I was talking to her about that piece and she's like, well, and then going over her health history at the same time. And I actually had the A1C and I know in Canada, you can't do this yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but have your patients condition your patients to bring their A1C, know their A1C when they come in. And I do encourage that being done quarterly and because it's really important because it can change. And blood, blood glucose tolerance test is also really great. But so I was talking to this patient, she was diagnosed and she's just this pre precious woman. And she's diagnosed uh, two months ago and her physician gave her a little bit of like didn't talk about oral health and we all know how incredible our role is in diabetes and um did not talk about that and didn't recommend her to refer to a nutritionist or a diabetes educator she gave her such little information and she's overwhelmed and so she's trying to do all these things right and like we were talking earlier when you when your insulin is out of whack, uh, your hormones are out of whack. So she's got these cravings, she's at a loss. And so absolutely she needs, so with a diabetic, they absolutely, we need to be collaborating, not just referring. We need to be talking. I need to be talking to her physician. She needs to go to an endocrinologist. We need to be talking to her endocrinologist. She needs a nutritionist. We need to be talking to her nutritionist. And she very well may need a health coach or a life coach to learn how to do all these things things because it is extremely overwhelming. And so we have to love her well, baby step her into health. And it's, it's a lot. And we don't expect you to take this all back on Monday morning and start doing everything that all of us are talking about, but start talking these pieces, start looking for them, and then start learning how to collaborate with physicians. And if you want to learn more about that, you know, reach out to me because that's something that I'm extremely passionate about. And just through trial and error, learned how to do it and trying to be better. And I know, Carrie, that's a big, that's a big uh, responsibility in your practice as well. Now, and if someone has dementia, who might you try to collaborate more with, or if you're worried about that aspect of the patient? You know, it, it's quite complicated to be honest, because so many general practitioners, we in the world of Alzheimer's disease right now, um, general practitioners are waiting until symptoms show up. There is not a preemptive strike on this. And so I mean, we have had conversations when we felt that, um, you know, patients' cognition was going down and talking to family members and things like that. But that, that relationship is really not there yet because what the information that has to come out and that people have to understand that is the only thing that I really do anymore um, is the prevention strategies. You know, Michelle talked about A1C and, and um, your diabetic patients. Something that you need to consider, which Michelle hasn't had time to talk about this, is moving all the way back to somebody's health history for both, for everything, but it will take my wheelhouse, which is, is brain health. So on a lot of health histories, you see people say pre-diabetic. <laughs> okay, well, that's, if you're not going to do anything, that means you're a diabetic because that pre goes into post. 
And um, what we know about the brain is that diabetes is an incredibly high risk factor. But what we also know, it's not an end all be all. If you are a diabetic right now and you're getting treated and you're on medication and your numbers are down, you're good, you're, you're better, your risk factors drop. It is chasing the disease for 10 years that your patients do all the time. It's being a, a pre-diabetic that's really a diabetic and we're not willing to do anything about it yet. So that's where as a hygienist and, and what Michelle is doing, these assessments of A1C and eat, eat, okay, so Canada can't do this yet. You can open a patient's mouth and, and you can look oftentimes and tell we've got an insulin situation. We are pre-diabetic. That starts the conversation, getting them treatment, getting them um, in the right direction um, is, is super important. And I know that I just went off the rails with that, but it's, important. it's something it's also important. to consider with your female patients. Um, it is really important to put on health histories and I could get on a long tirade of this, but somehow putting on health histories from this point forward is a woman um, premenopausal, postmenopausal. Because what happens postmenopausal to insulin, our, our brain is, um, estrogen is the glucose um, metabolizer. It is our glucose, because our brain runs on glucose. That doesn't mean that you eat a bunch of sugar. That's a whole for another, the course I teach. So, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that you have to look for postmenopausal patients. The world is different. The world is different orally. The world is different. Um, because of estrogen and especially um, for the brain. So you really need to, to look at that and, and, and really take a, a front seat as I talk about um, doing some of these assessments very thoroughly when we go into post um, menopausal patients. And so, working with a physician that really understands hormones, because let me tell you, right. so many physicians will be like, oh, that's normal for your age. Well, screw that. We don't want that. We want normal. We want to be healthy. And so like we work with Dr. Paul Thompson because he really looks at all of your hormones. He actually looks at your insulin. Most people will just look at A1C. I wish everyone would do the blood glucose tolerance test because even that, so you may do an A1C test or I may do an A1C test and they show normal but that patient could go and get a blood glucose tolerance test and, and they could show pre-diabetic or even diabetic with that. That actually can show up two decades beforehand. And I learned that from Dr. Gina Pritchard. So that's really great information. And so, sorry, I went off. This is like really fun for me. <laughs> well, ladies, this is so exciting stuff. Can you give us sort of like a timeline if we were going to have an appointment and we need to, like, how long should we be expecting to um, review these risk factors and how it all links together? Just so, you know, we get 15 minutes to work or we're obviously, you know, we're usually doing the dog and pony, right? Like you're working and talking at the same time, trying to scream through your N95 mask and your face shield and all the other stuff we got on. Can I say, because I get it and, you know, with, with my coaching experience, I go in and the one thing is, you know, the average hygienist in, um, in, in the States, their perio percent is less than 15%. Um, so there's the first problem right there. We're not diagnosing perio. So where we're looking at time, I don't have time. Well, are you doing bloody profies all day long? And believe me, I'm not being critical because I understand that every single one of us is doing our best and we are trying to be our best for our patients and we're thinking about them and we can't help, but at times think about the money. Can they afford this? But we have to get away from the insurance. We have to get away from the money and we have to start focusing on the health. It's not my responsibility to tell my patient, it's, it's my responsibility to tell them what their disease state is. It's their decision and their responsibility to decide to do it, but I can't ignore it. And I can't treat them as a healthy patient, which is what a profi is and see them every six months when in fact they have gum disease and we're putting them at risk for a whole lot of systemic disease. And so that's the, 
most important place to start is truly diagnosing. And you cannot be afraid to, if you have a patient that you've been seeing for 20 years and you've been treating her or him uh, as a healthy patient, a prophy, and you care about them, but it's been, you know, they have four millimeter pockets, five millimeter, even one five millimeter pocket that patient is diseased and we have to relook and you get to have this, dis this discussion, just do the risk factors, the oral systemic risk factors from AOSH, just start talking that piece. That's so important. Talk and diagnose and start treating. And so I don't expect, again, I do a whole lot of stuff. No one is going to do that. You want to all punch me in the face right now because I'm telling you all the stuff that I do. I don't know. I didn't start doing that. I started because I worked with some great docs that knew how to diagnose perio the right way. And they weren't afraid to do it because they were truly taking care of the patients. And so I'm extremely empathetic to every single hygienist out there. So diagnose, it takes a good two hours, but I know we don't have that. So if you only have an hour and a half with that new patient, um, then, then you would do less. Maybe you wouldn't do salivary testing at that visit. Maybe that visit you truly are just diagnosing and educating. Do the, the probe chart, complete probe chart, like the whole thing. And, um, okay. Can I just, I'm going to vent for two <laughs> seconds on that. We were taught how to do that in college. We are, conditioned to do a complete probe chart. Let's do that complete probe chart. If we don't have time to get to their cleaning because it takes too long, do that complete probe chart. Because guess what? We're gonna get coverage if we do that complete probe chart and we do a great clinical note speaking the AAP guidelines. This patient is diseased. This patient has systemic disease, uh, grade B and go into detail about that. There's so many things. It's really, it's just beginning to do something. Yeah, the new guideline is extremely helpful for us to make the case about where they're at and getting supplemental, um, you know, what I call coupon, uh, um, you know, assistance for them towards their overall health, you know, so mm -hmm. I totally am in agreement with you on that. So as you get comfortable diagnosing, then you're going to bring in the microscope and salivary testing. They're really easy. In Canada, you don't do A1C testing, so it's going to be really simple. Hey, can I have your doctor's number? I'm going to send this referral collaboration to your doctor because I want to start having a conversation. You have gum disease. You also have diabetes. You have heart disease. So I want to discuss with your doctor the best way that we together can treat you. Do we need to refer you to a nutritionist? So conversation, start with that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Anne, can you dig a bit more for me? I love periopathogens and periodontal, you know, all things bugs. That That is like something that I, expect, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a bit corny. That's why I've got my group of people here. But can you kind of enlighten us a bit about some of the pathogens that are related to Alzheimer's or linked or sure. it's, it's weird. It's weird to talk to you, of all people, <laughs> right? <about pathogens. laughs> like I'm sitting here going, no, Carrie, can you share with me what you know about pathogens? <laughs> um, but I'll Pop just tell quiz. you. Pop quiz. I know. I'll just tell you my little bit, and then you can just turn me off if you're like, oh, no. <laughs> um, but I actually do know about certain pathogens. And of course, we, you know, hundreds of billion, you know, we got a lot of bacteria going on, but we have high risk pathogens. And I know that you guys have taught about this. Um, and you test for it. So we have high risk, we have moderate risk, we have low risk pathogens. I'm going to just talk about the brain. And when, before I, I preface all of this to say right out of the gate, please, as a hygienist, do not, because you're ruining it for our industry to say that these pathogens have a causal relationship to Alzheimer's disease. We are not yet there to say causal, um, there is bi-directional, there is, I, there is one causal study. Um, I, I, I just, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter to me that it's causal. Um, it is inflammation, it's infection that's getting into the brain, right? It's either going through the mouth, the sinus cavity, through the cranial nerves, up the nose, it's, it's getting into the brain. So some of these bacteria does cross the blood brain barrier. 
that's what we're worried about. We are with these pathogens and the way that the brain works, which I'm going to get into that hopefully here in a little bit, but the, the way the brain basically works is we have this innate immune system, super cool. It handles its own gunk up there. And so we, there's this brigade of microglia cells that come on. So we've got this ugly pathogen, this brigade comes in and then it lays down the hallmark amyloid beta plaques and taut tangles that leads to Alzheimer's disease. So it would make sense, less pathogens in the brain, the less the brigade's working, less Alzheimer's plaques. Because as we sit here right now, which this is relatively new evidence, we are making amyloid plaques right now with insults and things that are getting into our brain, which is, which is great. Um, unfortunately, our brain sometimes goes rogue and does things that it's not supposed to do. So what our job is to decrease these risk pathogens that get into the brain um, and decrease inflammation, right? All these pathogens increase inflammatory cytokines and we know as hygienists, right? We, that's the opposite of what we want. The best causal relationship is spirochetes, Michelle said, and it is a beautiful sucker to have on a microscope because it'll scare any pants off of any oh my patient gosh. going because they're swimming all over the place and that's in their mouth. But it's so much keeps- fun to see. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. But um, I get so excited. Continue. <laughs> Dr. Judith McLosey has studied spirochetes and brain health for over three decades. There was a study in 2017 um, and it went through something called the Hill criteria, which is basically the end all be all. Does the study actually prove a causal relationship? I mean, you have to go through criteria to be able to use the big C word. And it did that spirochetes have a causal relationship to Alzheimer's disease, treponemia denticola. You may remember spirochetes from Lyme disease. So that's another spirochete. And we know that we get cognitive issues with that. You may remember syphilis way back in the day. They put patients that had syphilis that were untreated in an insane asylum because they lost their brain function. So spirochetes is going to move probably to the front of the line. Um, Fusobacterium nucleatum is another one. That little sucker opens up tiny holes in blood vessels and compromising, making all this bacteria get into the bloodstream. So we want to drive that one backwards. Um, The biggest one that everybody talks about, quit smiling, Michelle. I love it. Sorry, I'm all giddy right now. (laughs) Is PG, porphyrinus gingivalis. So there are some studies. And a couple of years ago, there was a big one heard around the world that PG causes Alzheimer's disease in mice and PG causes Alzheimer's disease. Let's drive the bus backwards just a little bit. (laughs) I think that the study was good. It was too small. It's also supported by a pharmaceutical company because they want to sell a drug. And so what they're saying that PG releases a toxin called gingipanes. The leaders of neuroscience for Alzheimer's disease isn't hundred percent on board with this gingipane phenomenon. They're, they need more research. But the good part about that study that was released, that short little one way back is that it is extended and it's extended through 2021 and they have more people in the study. So the results will be in 2022 and the results so far are showing great gains about PG. Matter of fact, something interesting about PG, I read it yesterday, it was released on December 29th about there is a partner with PG. Carrie, have you seen this? That was just released about, Without this partner bacteria, which is a good bacteria in the mouth, PG can't cause the destruction. So they've pulled out a new pathogen that what they're going to try to do is isolate and and PG doesn't destroy unless it's got this healthy partner, which I think is just absolutely amazing. It Will was you just send released. That to us? Yeah, it was just released on the 29th. I just caught it like three days ago. So I haven't really gone <laughs> through the whole thing. Oh, well, that's exciting. But, um, so that's my, that's my PG one. And then candida, I think we need to all, always look at, um, so your diabetic patients off the chart, the, you know, they're such they a always have candida. They always do. Candida does cross the blood brain barrier and we're seeing, um, insults and inflammation, um, in, 
uh, in Alzheimer's patients. Now, what really gets tricky with this is that Alzheimer's patients care, moral care drops dramatically when they get the disease. And so where we have to look at this is not testing them. We have to go backwards. We have to look at 30 years before the contributory factors to that. I didn't end with the PG study. What they did is they took little mice and they swabbed their little mouths with PG and boom, they got inflammation and they got amyloid plaques. Well, if I swab a little mice with most pathogens, they're going to get inflammation and they're going to lay down plaques. And so that's where that um, Prevotella, uh, uh, Prevotella intermedia is another one that they're looking at. Tanarella forsythia. The same lead that was on that PG study, it's a Dr. Jan Potema, Potempa, um, which I might have, I have to throw this in there. I'm sorry. I have an end to maybe do an interview with this doctor and I'm to write an article about, and I'm totally excited about it. That's my <laughs> nerd in me. But anyway, um, Dr. Potima has said that there's more research that they're gonna get into more in that PG study leading out to um, those other two, Tanarella, Forsythia, and PI. So, sorry, that was long-winded. That was no. awesome. Awesome. And I think the takeaway from that is that this is a whole topic on its own is just really studying the bacteria and the, and the bugs, as Carrie says, and just really kind of getting yeah. to the meat and potatoes of what is happening there. Um, right. So yes, I wish we had another hour for just that, which I think Carrie, let's get on that and plan for that one. <laughs> um, but as far as risk factors go and, and brain health, I know that um, sleep is something that's also quite important. Could you talk a little bit about that? And then, I don't know, hypothetically, if some of us are having trouble sleeping during this pandemic, maybe you have some tips for achieving better sleep? Hypothetically? I do. I, I, yeah, right. Um, sleep is critical. You know, all the leading researchers, no matter where you go, sleep is a very high risk factor in it. And it's complex in, in, a, in a multitude of ways. So we have two different kinds of sleep and I'm going to do it really quick. We have deep sleep and then we have everything else. Deep sleep is when we clear 40% of those amyloid beta plaques that we talked about is during deep sleep. It is, um, our brain actually shrinks to a degree and we get more fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, that's gonna flush out those toxins. That happens during deep sleep. Um, deep sleep is, is critical for lots of body functions. We know that proper sleep um, contributes or improper sleep contributes to every systemic condition that we have. And it even goes into depression as well, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, um, poor sleep. When, when Michelle was talking about ghrelin and leptin, which I don't know if that you said the words actually, but our hunger hormone that makes us, I'm so starving, that's ghrelin, <laughs> that increases with poor sleep. So mm -hmm. you don't get a lot of sleep and, and that increases. And then our I'm so full leptin decreases. So poor sleep goes to all of our body functions. So then we move that to brain health right there. So our diabetics have increased our risk. Um, what sleep does is it prepares the brain for learning the night before. And then the next day it solidifies, um, makes those short-term memory in our hippocampus, makes it go into like a hard drive. So sleep is critical for all um, all memory. Um, when you look at apnea, which Michelle can talk um, more about apnea and, and the critical link, obviously you're not getting enough sleep. You're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. Um, gasping directly damages the brain um, and dealing with memory reduction because we're getting less oxygen. We also know that nasal breathing increases oxygen in the brain um, by 18%. So sleep, all parts of sleep has, has to be good. Now, doing assessments, um, and, and Carrie, you and I have kind of talked about this a little bit, um, assessing for sleep is not just, you know, Michelle's in the unicorn practice and maybe your doctor <laughs> doesn't do sleep appliances, right? Maybe your doctor doesn't give two hoots about sleep. And I, I say this, and Carrie and I have talked about this, is that 
if your doctor doesn't do endo uh, root canals uh, for, for molars, you don't take the PA and see the abscess and go, hmm, I'm not going to mention that because we don't do it. So the same thing with sleep disordered breathing. You see a scallop tongue, 89% of those patients probably have sleep apnea. So find out in your community someone, a sleep physician that can do a thorough assessment. Um, if your patient says they don't sleep, trust them. They don't sleep. They're not just making that up. Um, guide them, get people in your community that are going to be able to um, assess sleep. As far as some tips that are, you know, it's all that don't do electronics, you know, all, all the stuff that you already know. I know you already know all this. You need to keep a cool room, um, literally 65 degrees in the bedroom, which is really kind of crazy for us women that are like, oh, no way. Um, let's see, uh, get it, going to bed at the same time at night, getting up at the same time um, the next day. Uh, are we really are a creature of habit in our circadian rhythms and, and it works that way on purpose. If you stay up late one night, don't make it up the next day in the morning. The morning is the most important time. So always getting up, which is tough on weekends, right? When we get up at five during the week. Yeah. Like we want to do that on the weekend, but that's really important. A lot of light in the morning, um, like inundated, don't wear sunglasses to work. Well, you guys don't get that much sun, but when you get a lot of sun, try to get as much light as you can in the morning and then drive it down at night. You get, your house is virtually dark in the evening. So here's some of the quick little tips. There's a four, seven, eight breathing. I wrote an article and a lot of what I talk about, you can go to my website. There's a lot of articles that I've written about this that expand on it, on it more. It's called four, seven, eight. So you're going to breathe in for seven. You're going to, I mean, you're going to breathe in for four, you're going to hold for seven, and then you're going to breathe out for eight and you're going to breathe out through your mouth. So you're going to go in through your nose. You're going to hold and then you go, you're going to get a lot more oxygen out when it comes out your mouth, as opposed to your nose. Doing that a few times before you go to sleep is an excellent way to drive um, our parasympathetic systems in the way that they're supposed to be um, reducing stress and helping you get better sleep. Also humming. This is really crazy. Humming with your tongue to the roof of your mouth. So we can all hum, <laughs> right? And your tongue's at the roof of their mouth actually increases melatonin, which oh, great. is insanity to me. <laughs> right, exactly. So don't hum during the day when you're like working on your patient or you'll be asleep. Um, there's so many good avenues. I recommend... Um, for anybody that's a sleep nerd, um, and even really wanting to know about a little bit about apnea too, Great book. this is excellent resource. And he is just a little haughty with his little accent. If you ever watch a video <laughs> that he does, um, I recommend this book. There's lots of different, as I said, if you go to my website, there's lots of different tips, um, and tricks. We talk about GABA and we talk about also a little handful of pistachios, um, an hour or so before you go to bed. And when I say a little hand, a little bit, just right here. Just Can you show right me how here. big your hand is in proportion to mine? I know if yeah, I'm right. over it's or not this. under. <laughs> it's teeny tiny, but pistachios have tryptophan. Tryptophan converts into, eventually converts into melatonin. So pistachios are like, a, can be a really good help um, to getting you to sleep. So anything i don't know i could go on do you want me to i love how nerdy you are <laughs> do i do too <laughs> that was awesome um one last question to finish it up because i know we're getting close to the end is and could you just tell us about cold sores and i understand there might be an effect on brain health before we uh conclude for today um yeah it um cold sores are probably the most studied in relationship to Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And it is unfortunate. And I start with the very beginning with this, just because you get cold sores does not mean that you are gonna get Alzheimer's disease, but you need to pay attention and you need to do it for your patients. Um, we're all housing 10 to 12 viruses right now. They're all sitting inside us. Um, it is when they get activated. That's part of our problem. There's been 150 HSB1 studies 
and brain health. It is a pretty serious relationship. So these viruses are just laying dormant in the brain. So we as clinicians, this is one of my, this is really important to me twofold. One, if you have a patient and you look at the health history um, and you see that they get cold sores, the very, very first thing that you do is you print out an acyclovir prescription that they can just have on hand because you know what? They may not be able to come in for you to do laser treatment, which I'll talk about in a minute, but that needs to be in their medicine cabinet ready to go. I don't care if they're 20 or they're 80. This cold sores isn't just because they're ugly especially in our seniors, this is super important that the activation of this virus that we try to drive this down. There's a drug, I don't know, it's available in Canada called Citivig. It's a little buckle patch you put above six or 11, depending upon the side of your cold sore and you stick it up there. Um, they are showing great results. Now they haven't studied as many, they've got a really middle demographic here. They didn't get into real seniors, of course, not pregnant women. I'd never recommend any of this for that, <laughs> but um, they have shown really, really good results with this drug. It's incredibly expensive unless you have in, an insurance that will cover it. But when we go into, so you've given them the prescription laser therapy, what we do in our practice is so important. And I know that you guys do lots of training with this um, and you better be trained because you don't want to hurt them, right? You, you need to be a professional at this. This isn't just putting a buckle patch on them. This is serious treatment that can be done easily, simply, um, quickly and productively in your practice. Um, and stopping the replication of this virus. You wanna stop the replication as fast as you can. Are you curing them forever? Well, there is some studies that you're not gonna get it in the same place. That's not the point at that moment. You're stopping the replication. You are stopping that virus from going everywhere and especially um, into the brain. I think that that as a hygienist, you know, dermatologists aren't doing this. We can do this quickly and easily, getting them on the schedule. The other thing that I have to say about cold sores, if you are not treating them with laser therapy, the patient calls, I got a cold sore. Okay, we're not gonna do your perio maintenance today, but come on in because I'm gonna do laser therapy on that cold sore and we're gonna get you better. We're gonna get you there quicker. You are not gonna treat that patient with an active lesion. And there's a couple of reasons why you're cramming that virus straight up their nose because you've got your aerosols going, you're getting it all around for you yourself. Right. And as a wife of a man who doesn't have vision in one of his eyes, because the herpes virus got in his eye, I am telling you, please do not you take cold sores seriously. When you have a laser, you're taking it seriously. You have the precautions and you're stopping it right there, right? So it's critically important that we take cold sores more seriously. Mm -hmm. And if you want to send your doctor to me so I can explain it and give them the studies um, that's making you do these, these things, uh, these perio maintenance on these patients, send them my way. It's anorice at gmail.com. So we, I'm happy I'll to send, talk to them. I'll send a follow-up email to everybody who's on here today and who's watching afterwards. Like we'll have the follow-up email set um, where we can share the resources, the, the two books that you both recommended, um, any studies that you want to share. So just send them on to me and then I'll send them to everyone, all the attendees. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Okay. Yeah. The lasers are great. You know, many people are wanting to go more and more holistic these days. I'm one of those people. And I can just say that I used to get uh, cold sores about once a year. It would be when I got a sunburn because I was outside that first really beautiful spring day and I'm not proud of it now. Um, but I, I've only had in the last decade, because I've been using lasers about that long, I've only had one breakout. And it was not in the same spot. 
that it used to be. And it was always in the same spot. So my patients, I have many patients who do not want an antibiotic or any type of treatment at all. Like they're so holistic and definitely don't. Um, so the, the laser is a really great source. And, um, but I agree with you. I agree with you on everything. And, but we all know if we have cold sores, we know when we're getting one. And, um, and so it takes five minutes really by the time they came in said, am I wrong, Beth? Like no. by the time they come in, sit down, take their blood pressure. Cause we always take blood pressure, mm-hmm. take their blood pressure, do their treatment and let them go. Yeah. It's quick. It's quick and, and effective. And I, I find that's one of the things in my experience that my patients have been the most thankful for that I've done, even yeah. though it was the simplest thing. For I've sure. Done. Yeah. It Isn't that nice? Be, and yeah. it doesn't matter what age there are. And I, I so agree with that. And like most of our patients are over the age of 50 in our practice and, uh, um, and they just, they hurt. And, yeah. uh, and even if the breakout and Beth, this is your strong point. So like, please <laughs> enter you like, but in here, even if it's already broken out, go in and see your hygienist or your dentist, because the, I mean, pain, it stops the pain just like that. I mean, am I wrong? My patients. No. Yeah. You're, you're, you're and it very speeds right. up healing it as well. Up healing. Yeah. And, and, and you alluded to the fact that they are, the studies are still kind of ongoing, but they're, it's, it's demonstrating that that probably won't come back to that same site again. They're out of discomfort. It speeds up their healing process. So it's, it's a win-win all around. It is. The stipulation in Canada is that you do, um, you do need to be certified, uh, or trained appropriately to, um, to use the lasers. So if you are someone who is interested in that, please reach out to us at RDHU. We can set you up. Um, but yes, I 100% agree. It's, it's my thing. It's one of my favorite tools for sure. Can I say one thing that I forgot to say when we talk about (laughs) sleep? No, it's just, I know, and people have gone off and, and all of that, but this has to do with the vaccine. And this is really important. If you are having the opportunity choosing whatever to get the COVID vaccine, vaccines, flu vaccine and things like that have been studied a lot. It is really important that you get good sleep a few days prior to getting a vaccine of any kind because poor sleep decreases antibodies by 50%. So I'm not saying that it's gonna render COVID vaccine useless, but it's it in all of the research, it's really important that you are properly slept before you go in. And our immune system, you know, our our um, all of our uh, natural killer cell, all our immune system is tanked when we don't sleep, and it happens immediately. So if you do have the opportunity, and that's something that you want to do, really pay attention to your sleep before you get that vaccine. And I meant to tell you that earlier. That's a great tip. And I want to, I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, I think we'll sort of summarize it and round it up right now. We will have some continuing uh, resources that Kath always sends out after the fact. Um, I know both Anne and Michelle are very passionate about oral systemics and Anne's actually going to be speaking at hot topics uh, from the AOSH um, organization coming up next weekend and it's a free uh, full day event so if you are interested in all of these aspects definitely check it out we'll put the link in the follow up. Um, Anna Louise you have some upcoming courses with RDHU as well don't you? I do next Saturday where I'm talking about the challenges of implant care and I also have a in, um, confidently instrumenting. So those who are not feeling really confident with um, hand instrumentation and we hope to have an on-site component uh, for two hours after it may get postponed till February, but we can get the theory part done just to review what you could and uh, increase your effectiveness while you're doing more hand work. Um. AOSH, uh, we have hot topics next week. Um, I'll be co-hosting that, but Dr. Chris Kammer, who's the founder of AOSH, American Academy for Oral Systemic Health, which really is the go-to source for oral systemic education. Uh, we also have a podcast, Time to Live by AOSH, and that's a great source. And Anne actually has been on the podcast and uh, it, it's a fantastic podcast. So go and seek that out. Hey, honey. And, and Beth, you have a, 
uh, process of care course. No, we have a process of care course, but not this weekend. We have practice <laughs> profile. Practice profile. Yeah. Sunday. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So if anyone is submitting in Ontario this month, uh, please join us and we're going to go through the practice profile with you. And for those of you who are submitting next January, it's a great time to start. Uh, let's get you started now so that you can enjoy your year and not be stressed out this time next year. Great advice. I have a call. All right, everyone. We you. totally went over. And <laughs> <laughs> see, that's what happens when we all get together. Oh, that was great. <laughs> well, it's been fun, everyone. So have a wonderful uh, rest of your day, OK? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing. Bye. Bye. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Bye. It was Bye. so much fun, y'all. It was so fun. Thank y'all. Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. I know. I, I want to say it. I'd love to say y'all. So y'all were saying like Canadian, uh, like, yeah. and I was like, oh, I want to say that. Like, I'm trying to think, okay, I got to get on this call. I don't okay. know if I want to talk to y'all all day long. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. Thank y'all. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. All right, a couple people just asking questions about how they get their CE for today. So there will be an after email coming out. There will be a short quiz for you to complete, very short quiz. And then after you complete the quiz, you will be emailed your, um, your CE, all right? And this session will be uploaded on the RDHE website. Just give us a couple business days to, to have that uploaded and edited. If you visit the RDHU website, you'll find all of our RDH View episodes under the RDH View tab. All right. And there was one question just asking about what the portfolio was. So for Ontario, we um, have to do our CE points and we call it a portfolio. So we have to do so many hours and report on our learning and bring it back for um, what, um, how it's improved our practice that way. Yes. And uh, for Sarah, who is asking, it's, it is the practice uh, profile part of your submission that we're going over on Sunday. It'll be four hours. Um, we basically start at the beginning, go through the whole thing. It's a discussion. Um, so you'll feel confident answering it by the end. Okay. Sunday right. morning from nine. Sunday. To 10. And we have Linda McClarty coming on with us as well. So it's Beth, myself and Linda McClarty, and you can register on the RDHU website. Absolutely. Or if you want to give us a call, you can give us a call or send us an email. All right. Yeah. You bet. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. Thanks for having me. Reviews. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming in. Honestly, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. It was, fun. It was nice to meet Bye, you. Anne. And I love nice your background. You. I love <laughs> thanks. it. Thanks. So pretty. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. Logging off. Bye, ladies. Bye. 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 Bye.